the words green, the words climate change, the words environment are going to be mentioned over and over, and she will hold to task the other parties on their platforms, so they can't just talk a green line. Um, I am enormously proud to be the deputy leader of the Green Party in Canada. It was a thrill to be asked by Elizabeth May to be her deputy leader. I did step down November 30th as provincial Green Party leader on December 1st, took up my post. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, for me, one of the most exciting realities is, is being with Elizabeth and seeing the impact that she has on people and seeing the impact that she has on other politicians and on, uh, and on, and on the media. She has charisma. She has, I mean, her resume, you know, is something phenomenal too. I think it was 14 pages when it was first said to me. Um, but it's about her ability to really resonate with people that I think makes her the star leader. Um, I've known her for almost 20 years. What some of you may not know is that when I was prior to becoming leader of the Green Party of BC and working with my husband, Paul George, who's in the audience tonight, um, and founder of Western Canada Wilderness Committee, when I was working with the Wilderness Committee and my lead campaign that I worked on was Clock But Sound, I made 52 trips to Ottawa and I stayed with Elizabeth at the time and she was the one that mentored me into politics. And she took me around the halls of Parliament Hill, introduced me to people. I'll tell you, there wasn't a person she didn't know on Parliament Hill. We'd get in an elevator, and she'd say, Oh, Joan, well, how was your holiday in wherever? And how was your daughter doing? She knows their names, their children's names, their husband's names. Uh, she, and she knows, she knows a lot of them, and she retains a sense of interest in who they are as people. And how how don't all of us yearn to be to, to have politicians who are interested in us as people, who actually want to know about us and, and reflect our desires and hopes in the policies that they bring forward? Um, so that that level of my experience with her is quite phenomenal. But I've seen also Elizabeth take stands. Um, that just leave you in awe of her commitment to principle. Um, I was in Ottawa uh, when she had been working for years to try and get justice for the people in, uh, in, in, in Sydney um, who were living on the polluted lands um, from the tar ponds there. And, uh, and, and no government would take action. And finally, in desperation, she said, somebody has to make them just pay attention to these people. And she said, the only thing I can think of doing is taking a personal stand and going on a hunger strike on Harlem Hill, which she did. And how many people, how many people in politics do you know that would put their life at risk for others? <coughs> That's Elizabeth May. Um, there are two things that I would like. Oh, I guess I should tell you a bit about her resume. It's so long, but just the highlights. Uh, she has, she does call herself a writer, and she has her latest book is How to Save Up and Plan Is It World? That's the world. How to Save the World in Your Spare Time. I really, really hope she doesn't write How to Win an Election in Your Spare Time. <laughs> that, that I know you can't do. Um, and she is going 24 7. But, but she is an author of numerous books and articles. Uh, she has been an activist. Uh, she headed up the Sierra Club of Canada for almost 20 years. Um, she, um, and she is now the course leader of the Green Party of Canada, having uh, retired, uh, resigned from her position with the Sierra Club last May um, and won the election as leader in August. So just less than uh, five months of uh, being leader and a world that she promised she would shake up politics and already uh, she has. Um, she has two honorary degrees. She has a chair named in her honor um, and that was the Women's and Health uh, Chair, now the Sustainability uh, Chair at Dalhousie. Uh, she is an officer of the Order of Canada in recognition of her work and contribution to Canadian society. Um, the two things that I want you to do before she takes the floor are these. If you are not a member of the Green Party of Canada, there are these brochures that are around the room. And in the inner page is a, a form that you can fill out to join the party. Um, if you are a member, and even if you aren't a member and are becoming one tonight, I want you to think of the beginning as generously as you can to the 
upcoming campaign. We are not a big party. We are not funded by big money. We are a part of the people trying to make a difference in putting uh, our government and the policies of Canada on a track that serves the interests of people. Um, so, with that, I give you uh, the first woman who will be elected as a Green Party member of Canada, a member of Parliament in Canada. Now, when I said this the other night, she, she looked at me with a puzzled look, and I say the first because, of course, her polls closed earlier. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I do give you uh, a woman who deserves to be in Parliament, who will rock politics in Parliament, Elizabeth May.
results from this can make financial donations a few years ago, well, actually a year ago, about now. That uh, really, I shouldn't be so afraid of Harvard because a minority government couldn't do that much damage. And in our group, in the NDP telemarketer, I think I argued my way into running for leader three party, <laughs> pointed out to this uh, scripted telemarketer that in fact a minority government could do a lot. Did he even know what he was talking about? Did he not understand that a minority government, without pointing out some cons, could reverse Canada's positions in international negotiations under the climate treaties? Could change the negotiating instructions from we need further emissions reductions post 2012. They're steeper and more meaningful. We must work with the international community. The decision to tell a negotiating team that we are to be recalcitrant and not helpful doesn't go before the House of Commons. And I said to this telemarketer, you know, you guys have to cancel every program that just got launched to deal with the climate crisis. They don't have to go to the House of Commons to cancel programs. Don't you realize the damage these people can do, even as a minority? I have to admit that as much as I understood exactly what they could do, they've been far worse than I could imagine. Because what the Stephen Harper government did immediately, no surprise, was then negotiating instructions to the first negotiating session uh, from the Montreal summit of last year, but now two years ago, 2005, an extraordinarily successful UN negotiating process that put the world on track to real emissions reductions in the second commitment period. Those of you who aren't Kyoto aficionados, just to remind you that the Kyoto Treaty, which is often referred to just simply as Kyoto, is a process. And the first commitment period is to reduce our emissions between 2008 and 2012, and at Canada's target is 6% to a 1990 level between 2008 and 2012. But that no one who negotiated those targets thought that that was the objective. It was merely a down payment on future action. It was merely the small first steps towards meeting the kind of emissions reductions that will be essential to avoid the tipping points in the atmosphere that would occur if we, for instance, lose the Gulf Stream, which is now 30% slower than it was three decades ago, or lose the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet, or lose the Greenland Ice Sheet. These tipping points of abrupt climate change become far, far riskier, unacceptably risky, if we allow emissions to arise to a point where this level of carbon in our atmosphere reaches 425 parts per million. Complex thought, but boiled down to science, we must reduce our emissions by 6% below 1990 levels by 2012, because in order to avoid these tipping points, we need to reduce emissions 30% below 1990 levels by 2020. And we need to reduce our emissions 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. And when Harvard had been in office less than a month, like that, Canada's negotiating stance for the rest of the world shifted. And we were no longer willing to entertain the thought of binding emission reduction targets in the next minute period. The Canadian electorate had accidentally allowed George Bush's Trojan horse into the room of Kyoto negotiations. Because the US didn't ratify Kyoto. So while that is a huge blow to global progress, it didn't mean that in Montreal we were negotiating. The US wasn't in the room when we negotiated the Kyoto minutes. They're not a party. But with the election of Stephen Harper, it didn't much matter. The US was in the room. Disguised as Kyoto. It was a terrible blow to international negotiations, largely unreported in Canada. And then, as I felt, would likely happen. The climate programs, whether energy or renewable energy or energy efficiency for low income housing, programs that were not by themselves going to reach the other target, but were, were at least important, were at least going in the right direction, were all canceled. And we saw this happening, we saw it unraveling. But I didn't foresee exactly how quickly Stephen Harper would militarize and change and Americanize the mission in Afghanistan. It was his first foreign trip. The imitation of George Bush in Canada, wearing militaristic clothing. It was khaki, I'm not sure if it was camouflage, or if that's just my imagination in hindsight. But we will recall Stephen Harper standing on the tarmac and saying that we were now part of the war against terrorism. You could afford to do a double take on that. I met a couple months ago with Senator Romeo Blair, 
who is, of course, I hope you know, a very, very fine man who's experienced unimaginable horrors. He's now a senator. And uh, he did mention parenthetically that no one in the Harper administration ever asks for his advice or speaks to him at all. He does have uh, contacts, close, close associates, people who are working with him uh, extremely closely in the Rwanda crisis are now the senior UN officials on the ground in Darfur. He knows that he stays in touch with them, he knows everything that goes on there, but they never ask his advice. And as he said, Stephen Harper, you know, runs his government in such a way that no one is minister of anything. In fact, you know, Peter McKay may have the title of Minister of Foreign Affairs, but the Minister of Foreign Affairs is Stephen Harper, in the same way that the Minister of Environment is Stephen Harper, the Minister of Women's Issues is Stephen Harper, and so on. But when I was talking to Ron Larry, he said, you know, when, when Stephen Harper said, we are in the war against terrorism, it was a fundamental shift to what the government of Canada had initially signed on for. It's a fundamental shift for peacekeeping, beginning to find a way to help a nascent democracy already being overtaken by narco warlords because it was too weak to say no. It shifted from something that was fundamentally about protecting human rights and rebuilding a society that had been war torn from well before the time that George Bush's uh, father's friends uh, managed to fund Al Qaeda and the Taliban to take down the Soviet occupation in Afghanistan to shift the mission to rebuild a society to protect the rights of women and young girls to go to school, to have water, to have electricity, to have any kind of liberal democracy, shifted it to be part of a war against terrorism, fighting down the Taliban in the hills of Afghanistan. And that is not ever mentioned in the debates. In the same way that Zaytoun mentioned, Kyoto was never mentioned in the debates. The war in Afghanistan was never mentioned in the debates. So with a minority government, this Prime Minister shifted us from a responsible global position on reducing greenhouse gases and fighting the climate crisis, from a responsible international position for peacekeeping, to being four square with George Bush on just about everything. In fact, I think Stephen Harper is a carbon copy of George Bush. And the pun of Harper is intentional. He's <laughs> <laughs> a carbon copy. The only issue in the last year in which Stephen Harper has deviated from the George W. Bush, Bush position is the one where he should have agreed with him. The banning of international draggers, the banning of trawlers on the ocean floor, the destruction of vast areas of marine habitat. On that issue, and on that issue only, Canada disagreed with George Bush. We still favor draggers. It was extraordinary. And when Stephen Harper was standing on that tarmac, he famously said, um, Canada, when we make a promise internationally, we don't cut and run. And that may not have been the case George Bush, that may have been John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how he missed that Kyoto is actually an international promise. And more than a promise, it's kind of an international contract. It's a legally binding treaty from which he is cutting and running as fast as he can. So we've had a whole year of Stephen Harper as Prime Minister, a long national nightmare. He came to office with five priorities, and whether you can agree with him or not, he has to be delivered on those five priorities. He promised to deal with wait times, he promised to deal with, uh, which of course, the hospital wait times are something that the federal government unilaterally has trouble committing to, but they did, they made a bad of his promise. They certainly haven't delivered on it. The Accountability Act is one that deserved much more media scrutiny than thought. I don't know how many of you follow the Accountability Act in any level of detail. The, the group, the only NGO in Canada that tracks transparency and democracy in government is a group called Democracy Watch. Sometimes you may hear Jeff Conacher on radio. I'll make it clear right now, Democracy Watch is just about out of money, so if anyone cares about having democracy defended by an NGO, you might send them a check because uh, nobody else seems to care about defending democracy in Canada. But uh, Democracy Watch tracked the accountability act. I will admit that when I was executive director of Sierra Club of Canada, and our office was next door to Democracy Watch, and I brought me to Jeff Conacher in the hallway, and I said, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, I'm afraid Harper's going to win. 
oh my god, oh my god, that takes it. Well, in terms of my issues, that's the best outcome. Because they have a really good accountability act plan. They've committed to 53 specific measures, and they'll be good. And, you know, I was horrified to find someone who was a colleague who could see a silver lining in this great cloud that I saw as the potential for a conservative Harvard victory. But I knew that that was, if anything, fair, and it must be that the Harvard conservative platform on accountability was a very good one, because I trusted Duff on this. Well, Duff Conacher is now a somewhat, uh, well, not just somewhat, he's enraged. Because the Harvard Accountability Act did not deliver the Harvard election promises. Just about half of the things that Harvard promised to put into the Accountability Act, the things that were meant to deal with the influence of corporate lobbyists, somehow didn't make it into the act. And strangely enough, the Harvard Accountability Act weakened the existing code of ethics guidelines for cabinet and senior civil servants. They have removed, like, this is bizarre, they have removed from the ethics guideline the requirement of the quote unquote duty to act honestly. They decided to take that out. So I really can't see how it is, other than the lack of media scrutiny, that Stephen Harper and his uh, former president of the Treasury Board, John Baird, now Minister of Environment, can have the hoods book to tell us that they delivered accountability and transparency in government when they removed the requirement of a duty to act honestly. And they've avoided the uncomfortable reality that some of their own cabinet ministers have been lobbyists. For instance, Defense Minister John Conner was a lobbyist for the very defense appropriations firms for which he now builds up contracts. That was eluded, that was dropped from the accountability act. So that's one of his checkpoints. So forget wait times, forget the accountability act. Of course, another famous election promise was not to tax income trusts. Now, personally, it was pretty obvious we needed to tax income trusts as a matter of what happens to an enterprise when profits are siphoned off elsewhere and not reinvested. You can see that over time, this wasn't going to be good for the health of Canadian enterprise, whether industrial or through banking or commerce or anything. It was a, a very interesting tax avoidance scheme. But at the point that the Harper government well, at that point, Harvard as candidate, promised people that they would never trust in the tax income trusts. They, of course, accelerated the extent to which people trusted in that and put their life savings into something that they were told would no longer be a risky investment. I mean, you should be suspicious if someone promises you high rates of return on investment because chances are that there is high risk. But Mr. Harper made it clear that there was no risk, and then he broke that promise. Certainly, I hope the Green Party potential candidates in the room will use this to good effect when you're out on the campaign trail, because if nothing else, it did show a certain um, propensity to break promises. Unfortunately, on Mr. Harper's commitments during the electoral campaign around the environment, he didn't break any promises because he never made any. The platform of the uh, Conservative Party in the last election was so skinny on its environmental commitments. They wouldn't even agree to commit, as every government from forever has committed, to complete the national park system. And that one was, you know, not willing to commit to that, not willing to commit to anything much. And certainly, on the climate crisis, Stephen Harper appointed Corbin Knight Ron Ambrose and told her to go forth and confuse people. <laughs> Tell them one thing one day, another thing the other day. And the poor woman was put in charge. I mean, really, there's no question of the way the Harvard Harvard operates. It's one man role. Do you know that no minister in the Crown is allowed to give a speech until the Prime Minister's office is dead, word for word? And not only is it true of ministers of the Crown, but of individual members of Parliament. And not only is it true of ministers, members of Parliament, it's true of senior and even mid rank civil servants. If they're invited to a local rotary, they have to submit their speech in advance to the PMO, and they have to prepare to cancel their appearance if the Prime Minister's office does not approve the speech. Yeah, last, uh, last, was it last summer or early fall? No, well, June. 
The Glow Commons in Vancouver on sustainable development. Ron and Ambrose was to speak, and I have a very good authority that 20 minutes before she was to give her speech, she got word from the Prime Minister's office that the speech had to be changed, and all references to sustainable development had to be removed. Well, since this was a conference on sustainable development, there were, there were a few references, whether they were, you know, obviously a, a bunch of fakery or not, there were references, and there were nine separate uses of the offensive term, sustainable development. And so, Mr. Carey, Ron and Lori made it known to bureaucrats from the Ministry of, of Natural Resources that all references to sustainable development would be changed to responsible development. Now this is interesting because the act by which natural resources of the department now operates in its objects claims that the department is described towards sustainable development. There's kind of a, a very strange Orwellian process that was afoot. So you couldn't talk about sustainable development. You certainly couldn't, couldn't talk about Kyoto. And not only that, on the government websites, they pulled down the site that explained the science of climate change. So all of this was going on at the same time that the climate crisis kept dealing more and more and more signals our way that all was not well on the planet. And it's one thing to call Kyoto a liberal promise. That's really offensive to me. A negotiated treaty by the government of Canada, passed by the majority of parliamentarians. Sure, Stephen Harper and that time the Alliance Party did conduct the longest filibuster in the history of the House of Commons to try to stop the passage of the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. But the government of Canada, not a political party, not an individual politician, ratified Kyoto and made a binding promise to the world that we would live up to our commitments. Ron and Ambrose, and this was one of probably one of the more embarrassing moments for Canada in international negotiations on any treaty. By virtue of the fact that Canada hosted the last international conference negotiating progress under the Climate Treaty and the Kyoto Protocol, and because of the customary position occupied by the Ministry of Environment of the country that hosts a negotiation, Stéphane Dion, former Minister of Environment, current head of the party, Stéphane Dion had been in charge not of Canada's participation in that treaty and that negotiation in Montreal. For those of you who are following all this, it was the 11th Congress of the Parties, top 11. Stephanie Young wasn't there on behalf of Canada. He was there as a senior United Nations official to oversee the negotiations. He was given the title of President of the 11th Congress of the Parties. And unfortunately for the world, that's a position which the Minister of Environment for the host country occupies for a full year overseeing progress on global negotiations on climate, which meant, if you missed it, that Ron Ambrose was the senior UN official in charge of progress for global negotiations on climate until November of this year, when she was replaced when the next climate conference took place in Kenya, and the Minister of Environment from Kenya, who actually thinks it's a good idea to reduce emissions, took her place for a whole year. We had a president and the Congress of the parties who go to meetings and say, we're not going to meet our targets in Canada. It's impossible, impossible, impossible. So that was direct from Stephen Harper. So what do, what do we attribute the last couple of weeks of, as Adrian said, the attempts to wrap the Conservative Party in green? Well, it's not that he suddenly, over Christmas vacation, decided to pick up the most recent reports of the intergovernmental panel on climate change and read the cover to cover or get a scientific reading or even to pop the DVD Jack Layton gave him of an inconvenient truth into the DVD and watch it. It was pretty clear that what accounts for Mr. Harper's transformation and Ronna Ambrose's demotion and John Baird's evaluation, evaluation, evaluation was the polls. Not science, but pollsters. And finally, got Stephen Harper's attention on the issue of climate change. I don't know how many of you listened as carefully to CBC News as I do, but it was a week before Christmas when I heard Stephen Harper on, I think, the 7 a.m. broadcast referring to, quote unquote, the so called greenhouse gases. <laughs> a little bit of a hint, he didn't really believe in it at all. And he still doesn't believe in it. But he can read polls. And he's very concerned that if he 
does break the Alliance Conservative Republican Party of Canada <laughs> in a green record. They can't hope to form government again. So we have John Baird looking, oh my goodness, didn't he look straight when he looked at Stanley Park? He was invoking. I've never <laughs> seen, you, you don't know John Baird. Have you ever seen him in the House of Commons? He's president of the President of the He's their most aggressive, pugnacious, pugilistic, front venture parliamentary. He's just plain boorish. But suddenly, he got religion. And he walked towards the Stanley Park and he said, this is a wake-up call. Now, I don't know how he slept in Hurricane Katrina. The wake-up call is that how did he miss Hurricane 1? Did he miss the Point Pleasant Park and all the down forests from the first full force tropical hurricane ever making landfall in Nova Scotia? Because our waters south of us were just a little too warm to do what they usually do, which they had forever done which was slow down tropical hurricanes enough that when they hit Nova Scotia, they were storms and not hurricanes. That was devastation. The retreating glaciers, I guess you missed that. The receding Arctic ice, the North Pole, the melting permafrost. He missed, I mean, considering how much I thought conservatives were all about money, how did he miss the $4 billion lost due to the pine needle outbreak in British Columbia? I think you know the answer. It's the polls. So what we need to do as citizens concerned about the climate crisis is make sure they don't get away with a public relations campaign disguised as serious action on the climate crisis. We all know that the only thing that's going to address the climate crisis is not only to achieve the other targets, which for Canada become increasingly difficult with every day that goes by with no action, but be prepared to stick with it. And we miss our targets in the first period, which by the way, we do not need to do. We can still reach the targets. And the Green Party of Canada has a very detailed plan. We have a couple of paper copies in the room, but it's on our website. It's the Green Party of Green Plan for GP Squared, and it covers exactly how we can get to Kyoto targets even now. But it won't be easy. It won't cripple our economy. Although goodness knows, you know, you, you, you wonder what kind of uh, economic analysis could miss the fact that the senior economist, former senior economist of the World Bank, I'm sure you noticed this, Sir Nicholas Stern, in a special report to the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the UK, reported that if we fail to act on the climate crisis, our global economy will be hit with a whopping seven trillion dollars in damages. I mean, I don't know, again, I always find it offensive that we can often get people's attention when we put the losses in dollar signs instead of human lives or loss of species, destroyed ecosystems, irreversible climate change. But $7 trillion should have got someone's attention. Now we need to ask, what are they prepared to do? And if they do not say they're prepared to meet killer targets, then nothing they say is anything more than electionary. I'm glad to see the program being brought back. I'm glad they thought we paid up the $30 million to create more rainforest. It was overdue by more than a year. I'm glad I wish the anti program was back the way it was. They removed the role of the energy auditor to be able to provide free audits. So once again, it makes it increasingly difficult for people of lower income to access the program. And without that free audit, it makes it increasingly difficult for community associations to have to train energy auditors on the job locally to go out and do those audits. Those people, I don't know if you know, those energy auditors across this country would come in that program and small community organizations that deliver that service. I saw it in a couple of communities when I was traveling this country in the leadership campaign. They received an email on a Thursday that said, Friday, the program ends. Funding ends in less than 24 hours. Clean out your taxes. It wasn't a phased out program. Gary Run, you remember the program, was in a press conference in Toronto just this, two days ago, in which he had the gall to say, well, you know, it, the, the question was from a reporter from Now Magazine in Toronto. He said, Mr. Lund, wouldn't it have been better if you thought the Enterprise program needed to improve? 
improvement, you'll just wait a second. If you left it in place and tweaked it once you figured out what you didn't like about it, instead of killing it, and he said, well, we, we, we did, we, we did basically that, I said. Checks are still going out. The program wasn't completely wrapped up. Well, we're actually having contractual obligations, particular taxpayers, to pay the money they promised. They sent out checks, but they demolished the program. They sent small NGOs and community energy auditors to other jobs in other communities because the program was demolished. And Mr. Lund can try to dress it up all he likes, but the new conservative version of the Enterprise program is not as good as the original. And they have not re-announced, well, they might do it next week, they're re-announcing all the things they killed um, to their advantage sort of daily. They have not re-announced the program for low-income housing for energy efficiency. And they certainly have not committed to Kyoto targets. So we have a very interesting one-year record on the Stephen Harper government. It, I hope, will not be a scourge that lasts much longer on across our land. Uh, the Green Party of Canada represents something quite different than traditional political parties, the old line parties that don't want to talk about themselves. We want to talk about issues, we want to talk about solutions, and we want to make sure that when the next federal election occurs, which could be this spring, certainly within the next 12 months, that the other parties don't get away with hiding their positions on issues because they're calculating their strategic votes. I find it hard to forgive Jack Layton for never allowing the words key over and pass his lips in the last three or two days. It would have been so easy. That's really why I changed my life. I was watching the leadership debates with my daughter, I'll sit down and I was watching the leadership debates with my daughter, it's all four of them, two English, two French. And at one point, in one of them, Paul Martin finally said, Mr. Harper's against Kyoto. If you elect him, you'll lose Kyoto commitments. And then the questions went to Jack Layton. And my daughter, then 14, started yelling at the TV set. Now she knows Jack Layton. We, we've been friends a long time. He was at my Christmas party a couple years ago. She said, There's your opening, Jack. There's your opening. And he didn't start talking about the climate. He didn't start talking about Kyoto. He didn't say, She said, There's your opening, Jack. There's your opening. Jack! And then for the first time in my life, I heard him yell a four-letter word that was not Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, I've got two choices here. I can either slit my wrists or listen to my friend Amy and run for the other green party in Canada. <laughs> so I made my choices. I've had a great time because Canadian democracy is something to be respected. Canadian citizenry is a population that deserves respect for their intelligence and nothing but straight talk, content-driven policies, solutions that make sense, and a commitment to a better world. We do not have to accept the shorthand, nihilistic slogans of corporate Canada, the words, oh well, it's, you know, those are nice ideas here, but this is the real world. You know, I'd like to remind some of those people who want to tell us we can't treat with something better, that in the real world, the world will not out. In the real world, Nelson Mandela got out of jail and was president of a free South Africa. And in the real world, I can be prime minister. Thank you. <laughs>
good. If I have a chair, I can't see you. As people come up to the microphone, can I just say, I remembered the second thing I was going to ask you to do. Uh, oh, it was very man, We have a website, a website which is an online website uh, to, to uh, request uh, the consortium of TV broadcasters to include Elizabeth May in the debates. Our party is in negotiation right now. We've done a poll. 77.2% of Canadians want her in the debates, but you can make a difference. The negotiations are going on right now. When you go home, take it down. Get out those pens, paper, demand, democratic debates.ca. It takes a minute to fill in that petition. Come and click that website, demand democratic debates. Email it to everyone you know. Thank you. <laughs> You win first ever. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. They talked about Canadian democracy. Do we have Canadian democracy or democracy in Canada without proportional representation? <laughs> well, you don't even have to answer that. It's rhetorical. No, I think, I think we can elect three party entities without proportional representation, but true democracy requires proportional representation. My real question is about strategic voting. I think a lot of us might like to see a back side of the conservatives. Really. Is it there? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
all negotiated with leadership from Canada. We also negotiated improvements in rate of work quality report and funding accordingly. We also were in the forefront on the issue of the climate crisis, hosting the first global conference in 1988. We were one of the first countries to take on targets. We were supportive. The government of Canada helped support the Brown Commission, supported the Rio Conference. Brian Morgan personally, this was a weird one, saved the biodiversity convention when George Bush's father said he wouldn't sign it. A lot of the G7 countries were prepared not to sign it either. And Brian Morgan, within 24 hours of George H.W. Bush, said he wouldn't sign it because, by the way, pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. That's how we can not save biodiversity because it had a provision in the treaty that there would be an equitable sharing of benefits from, say, discovering the Rosen Carrier with the Lynn Madagascar and turning it into a children's leukemia drug. Madagascar didn't benefit the pharmaceutical companies did. So the idea of sharing benefits had the pharmaceutical companies pushing hard. So George H.W. Bush said he wouldn't sign it. Well, Ronnie right, said in 24 hours, Canada would. And that made the Wally UK and Japanese vote come back in favor of biodiversity. We also saved the South Forestry. Higher water would not have been safe without Brian Morgan's personal intervention. I mean, I was there. Was that there are strange things about the fact that over the time of the Morgan government, $5 billion in the Green Plan, commitments at the Rio or Summit to climate change and biodiversity, uh, the, the cessation of the commercial Atlantic salmon catch, you just start adding them up. This is the whole list. I think, gosh, well, you stack that through over what? Start the nuclear industry. That's it. Really, in terms of environmental thing, very well. I mean, he, 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 he loved nature, but he didn't like environmentalists. Um, if you go forward to French now, disastrous record. And Martin had a short record, not a time. As Rick Murcher said, the case of the M Award, he said, in fairness to other prime ministers, some were there all too briefly to be able to deliver a coherent environment plan. I speak, of course, of John Turner, Kim Campbell, and Jacques Fritton. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's no way to assess who is the greatest PM that you don't come up with Brian Moran. What would you say about green um, trade and climate change? Look, I, even as I was asked who was the greatest PM, considering the free trade agreement, I still couldn't come up with anyone other than Brian Moran. Now, as I said, well, I've been a very aggressive opponent of NAFTA, particularly Chapter 11. been involved in all those fights. The energy chapter of NAFTA is a disaster. But, you know, in terms of even with that as a factor, we do need to get rid of the energy chapter of NAFTA. We do need to get rid of Chapter 11. And the only way to do that is to signal the six-month provision to exit NAFTA. But NAFTA was actually brought in officially by Sean Crichton. Not that that gets priority on the hook, because he brought the free trade agreement in the first place and negotiated most of that. So it's just one of those things. And in, in having the, the, uh, the first presentation of the award to Mulroney was actually in June of 2005. And he was in hospital and unable to attend. And then Corporate Max Magazine got the idea once Harper came to power, this would be a good way of getting Harper to pay some attention to the environment. So it was very interesting. I don't know if you saw it on television, but Mulroney gave an excellent speech with Harper sitting at the head table. And for my sense, for some crazy reason, some, somebody with a bizarre sense of humor sat in between Jean Chouet and Stephen Harper at the head table. It was an excruciating meeting. But Jean Chouet was his own friend when he was a car concert. But, but Stephen Harper sat there and actually heard Brian Mulroney say clearly that the climate crisis was real, that, it was just, that there was no threat greater to our survival of this planet other than global nuclear war, and none of it signed. So it was an attempt to try to get any government to do the right thing. And I think corporate might nice times and do something quite brilliant in their timing of having this on Earth Day, award for Greens PM. It turned out to be the first speech Brian Murray had given me in Ottawa since leaving office. It became very high profile, obviously, and some people think about some kind of um, you know horrible person to acknowledge the record. But um, and one of the other things I mentioned at that night was uh, a lot of people forget not environmental attribute, but I'm personally grateful that Brian Mulroney went against Maggie Thatcher to uh, sanction South Africa, which was the, and one of the first world leaders, if not the first world leader, the Nelson Mandela called when he got out of jail for Brian Mulroney. There's some weird things in that record that you don't think about. 
But uh, when Stephen Harper was called to the stage to introduce Brian Warren at the Fairmont since Earth Day, which is an award for Greenest PM, Harper managed to give his introduction without mentioning the words environment, <laughs> or Earth Day, or Green, and he lauded Brian Warren for his corporate record and for a two back to back majorities. And as I sat there watching that, how we prepped his speech writing to the advance with one who announced the $30 million to break their rainforest, these few things you could announce would look good. I wasn't getting anybody who was still staring up for me. Trying to get some progress out of that. I'm like, if the man can't even mention the word environment on Earth Day and the word of Friday morning, we're going to work out one I've been very concerned that the rails built, as far as I'm concerned, blood, sweat, and tears for this country made Canada. And as a university student, I just love to take that train and so many people, and they're not used, you know. And I think that Brian Mulroney was probably responsible for that. But do you know what is going on with the rails? What we need, and this is a big part of the big part of the platform, is to, it's in GB Square, we need to get more of the shipment of goods out of trucks and on freight, and we do need separate rail lines from passenger rail. Because what's happened is not only do we have massive cutbacks in the places that are served by passenger rail, I mean, you used to be able to get from Regina to Saskatoon by rail, you used to be able to get from Edmonton to Calgary by rail, you used to be able to get to Cape Breton Island from Halifax by rail, no more. When you do train, I travel the train pretty much constantly. But the problem is that the tracks in the split of CICP, via rail up the trains, and freight up the tracks, and the traffic signals. So if you travel by passenger rail, you find yourself on the side of the lot because the freight must get through because that's where the profit margin is for the people who own the tracks. And passenger rail is a poor second class citizen in that scenario, and the tracks are old. We need, you know, we, we've, we've got a you know, cave and that's a bombardier building trains all over Europe and China and everywhere. We should have, in the most traveled tracks in Canada, where we should be laying down a new track, moving people out of their cars, out of airplanes, which are enormously moving, and back onto trains. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we endorse the solutions that pass into the uh, Transport 2000 is put forward, and it is a significant part of a Green Party scenario for making Canada, you know, we're not just looking at, uh, at this in terms of restricting pollution, but thinking about enhancing quality of life. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that enhances the quality of travel, like having the chance to watch the countryside go by. And when you think about it, if you have an experience of being in France and taking the TGV, you feel like you're floating on the air and you're doing a million miles an hour. I mean, it's really, it's uh, high tech, and it's uh, a, really a scandal that Canada, as you say, was sweat and tears to build the, the national dream, and we're dismantling it piece by piece, and we need to rebuild it and make it better.
until they got to a certain place in income, they would be tax-free. So we would eliminate poverty, because that's a really important goal for the Green Party of Canada. We would shift Canada's foreign policy back to peacekeeping. We would ensure that we were not participating in NATO land missions, but only UN land missions, in which Canada play a role of peacekeeper. We would meet the 0.7% goal. We would make poverty even to be not only domestically but internationally. And we would ensure, of course, that we meet our Kyoto targets through uh, enforced regulations. We can't go through the tax system. Otherwise, these taxes alone would be too much and too huge. So you need kind of the right amount of tax plus regulations plus a kind of systemic change bringing more resources to local levels. We do need more money at local community levels. Jane Jacobs wrote about this in the last book, Our Age Ahead, that we need to have taxes where people need them for mass transit for livable communities. One way the Green Party would do this, in addition to redirecting some of the federal taxes that are taken in, is to make it possible for Canadians in their RRSP deductions to choose that their RRSP is dedicated to their local community for investment in infrastructure in their community and not to some offshore uh, mining operation. So many pension funds, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is tied up in open pit coal mining next to Jasper National Park. And I mean, some of these investments are appalling. And that's not too. They have Mac well, Look, it's crazy. People look at this, you know, like the, the, the advertising the intensity of make your RSP donation, and then nobody really wants to raise the money though. But if you choose, I want my retirement money to be in my school. I want my retirement money to be in my local mass transit system or in my hospital. So these are just some of the, what we want to do as a party is our prime minister, we were in the cabinet, and Adrian was of course minister of finance. We would be able to, we, 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 our goal would not just be to crack the whip on things we don't like, but to ensure that the Canadian quality of life is enhanced, that we have more time in our lives for the common good, more time for volunteering, more support for community projects that enhance quality of life. And that we could, if we possibly could, speak to values and remind Canadians that, in the words of the Earth Charter, once basic human needs are met, development is primarily about being more, not having more. You can't preach morality, but you can try to end conspicuous consumption and the idolatry of the shopping mall yeah. through a demand. <laughs> and although they want to prime minister, I do promise you that there's room for any of you to do it 24 to try. We've always got a spare bed. Unlike the White House, even though he's a friend of mine, we're not going to charge you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Terry from Salt Spring, and um, well, I, I'm a bit of a pessimist on some things myself, and I don't want to dash everybody's hopes and so on, um, but what I'm asking about is what could be done as a federal government of Canada in regards to Plan B on climate change, and the reason I mentioned Plan B is because, quite frankly, looking at large players in the world industry, you know, space, China, Japan, um, and also looking at the science as you go ahead and ask, well, what about the gases out of the permafrost? What do you, you know, nobody's even mentioning everything that is under the ocean in terms of methane. I mean, there's no quantitative studies on that. Um, I'm personally not thinking, personally, you can keep your own, we're not stopping this. What can we do in terms of mitigating the impact of what is coming do we have, as a Green Party, any policies in regards to this? Yeah. Well, okay, there's no question that we cannot, you know, say, vote for us and we'll give you back coal winners. We can irreversibly change the chemistry of the atmosphere. We are locked into an unstable climate system for the foreseeable future. Now, the reason I don't give up on reductions like that, and Japan is moving in the right direction. And India and China are doing more than people think, although obviously, dangerous situation to go either way. There's much more awareness at the senior levels of the Chinese government of the severity of the climate crisis than there is right now at the senior levels of the Harvard government. For that matter, today, Washington, Alcan, and DuPont, and oh, a couple 
kilometers of them, shall I think, held a press conference calling for binding targets and emissions reductions. Uh, George Bush is giving his State of the Union address tonight, and it apparently it's going to be short because he knows no one likes it, and he's going to talk about emissions reductions against specific targets. Very interesting. But uh, we have to do as much as we can, as vigorously as we can, to reduce emissions so that we don't hit those tipping points. That said, we cannot reverse what we've already done, which is we now have 30% more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere than at any time through measured analysis through Antarctic ice cores than any time in the last 650,000 years, and likely more CO2 in our atmosphere than at any time in the last 20 million years through proxy measurements. So things are going to be unstable for quite a while. So the GP squared document does speak to the need for adaptation strategies. It does speak to the, and we are bound to these also legally under the framework convention on climate change, to have strategies to adapt to those levels of climate crisis that we can no longer avoid. It means that these strategies, particularly for those industries that are climate sensitive, fisheries, forestry, agriculture, tourism, we need to also think about our engineering. Uh, where we build near shorelines, how we build roads, how we build bridges. We are increasingly going to see unstable weather conditions. An area that needs huge levels of adaptation is our whole sewage infrastructure. Sewer treatment plants around across the country, of course, not Victoria, but sewer treatment plants. Good. I'm the creator of Mr. Bodie, we're getting. Oh, you're the So we do need to rebuild and retrofit. We need to be thinking about living systems, not just engineering. We need to figure out ways to protect water at source, have more forested areas in our watershed, do everything possible to avoid asphalt and fast runoff. This is where also these things have a you know a virtuous circle. If we have more of an urban food policy, more rooftop gardens, reduce air conditioning demand, grow some food capture some moisture, keep so much from going down into the drainage systems to overwhelm the sewage system. So we need a very holistic approach to this as well. The adaptation of climate change being ignored, it won't be cheap, but it only gets more expensive the longer we ignore it. Candidates, speak the candidates meeting, and the only one who answered the question with any level of knowledge at all was Andrew because he had attended the same talk that I had attended. Um, I asked at that time which which one of the candidates, with or without the support of their party, would support the idea of taking banks basically back to 100% reserves, or for the first time taking to 100% reserves, waking up the Bank of Canada and having it create our monetary system for us, our currency, to the 100% mark, and sort of tied in with that as well, start to take back the ownership of land, resources, and businesses in Canada for Canadians. I would have loved to see Gary on his face when he asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Flipping through his briefing book well, madly, or whatever was anything on monetary policy, but anyway, I shouldn't be mad. Um, exactly, but I think his words were somewhat too. Yeah, I don't really think the bank's very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yeah>. Okay. <laughs> but I wish I could tell you, because you said with or without support of the parties, so that gives me an opening. We are working on monetary policy and the question of, of you know, debt as the essential fuel for money and how do we get that to the 100% reserve based money. 
Uh, it is currently, our platform is under development. Adrian Carr is co-chair of the Shadow Cabinet. There are a lot of people who are within the Green Party advancing this for our platform, for our agenda. It clearly is at the heart of a lot of what's wrong with the way the current economy operates. And I have been uh, persistently lobbying. It's fortunate to understand that at 14 years. But everywhere I go, I find people who are aware of the issue and who want to see change. So I, I don't know, Adrian, I should go out like, we're working on policy, we're developing it. We appreciate your input. Let me put it that way. We're, as a shadow cabinet, we're trying to make sure that we have our platform ready to go well before the next election and that it speaks to bigger ideas that, I mean, I described the platform to the other parties as, you know, just jockeying for position to be at the cutting edge of the status quo. Uh, there's nothing new in those platforms. And I think, you know, this is one of those fundamental issues that needs to be raised. We need to talk about the oil, we need to talk about real issues that other parties aren't discussing. So, thanks. We, Andrew, we'll have to, Anything is taking notes. If we are, there is a little team. By the way, our, our Minister of Finance in Shadow Cabinet is named Peter Graham. You can find his email on the website. And if you wanted to help with his caucus with developing this policy, that would be great. Do you have a question? Is it four right now? Oh, one more. I, I guess the questions are quick. The problem is the answers. <laughs> What do you think it's going to take to get electoral reform at the federal level? I think it's going to take having enough Green Party members in there to fight for it. Because we know the NDP promised that it was a big party for them, and when Jack had the opportunity of trying to make that come through, he, he, it wasn't one of his priorities then. Uh, if we, we can get elected in the current system, if I'm in the debates, I know we'll elect our needs, and even if I'm not in the debates, I think we will. So we do need to have electoral reform. Given that we're going to be interested in a little bit more analysis, I think that we're going to be in a system of uh, minority governance for some time in Canada, back and forth. We used to be in long majority periods, liberal, conservative, conservative, liberal. We're in a different era now. We're having minority government after minority government, where even a handful, even one MP, make an enormous difference. And since the Green Party will not ever give up, Unproportional representation as a key goal to democratize the whole system. Even a couple of us can bring that up. So when you're in the Delta debate, you will bring this up. Oh, yes. Yes, and if any of you don't know about it, there's a great NGO called Fair Vote Canada. So do go to their website and help them out. It's fairvote.ca. They have a great campaign on right now featuring all that brilliant gone from, um, you know, CBC comedy truth before this hour is turning this one for the day to help on this. You know, the Air Force. Air Force. Yes, and, and he's got this whole thing where he looks like a doctor and he's warning Canadians about the dreadful tragedy of electoral dysfunction. I leave you on that thing. Well, I'll see any of our speakers for the evening, and uh, is, can we have a round of applause for the Thank you very much.